Let us pray. Our Father, we bless your name for this day. We thank you because of the privilege you always give to us to come and study the pages of the scriptures, the holy writings. Father, we're asking that today as we come before this word again, that we will extray our hearts, extray our intentions, extray everything within us so that whatever is wrong, you'll put it right and cleanse us with the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Father, we're asking that your word will enrich our souls and spirits even this day. Father, we pray that your name will be glorified in every one of our lives and our lives will get to that image of the Lord Jesus Christ that it ought to reflect. Thank you, Father, because we're here tonight. Let your hand be mighty in our lives as we study the word of God. In Jesus' name, we pray. Every Monday we come here for the regular and systematic study of the word of God. It seems strange that in various assemblies and gatherings and churches, there is not much emphasis on studying the Bible, and yet it is our very life. But we praise the Lord because of the privilege and the heritage he has given to us as a local assembly, as a unit of the church here. And regularly we have been coming and we have been studying the word of God. Now, in many circles, when they come together like this, all they do is just entertain one another. You know, many stories told, some true stories and some false stories, some fables all put together to make the members in the church and the congregation just have a nice time and just to laugh. And if you're a newcomer, it might surprise you that as we're here tonight, we just pick up the Bible and we just go from chapter to chapter, from page to page, and from verse to verse. Well, that's how we do it here every Monday. And it's always an enriching time we spend before the Lord. Now, you came with your Bibles here tonight. Can I see them? Raise them up and let me see. Now, newcomers, when you are coming next Monday, because I believe you'll be coming, you see all these people with their Bibles and some white sheets of paper were put in their hand. That's how to come. You come with your Bible. Thank you, you can put it down. You know, I found that in some places where they're just religious churchgoers, they are ashamed of the Bible. They manage to have a Bible, and um, at night it's under their pillow, during the day, it's all ruffled, and when they are managing to go to church, they wrap it up so much that not even the devil will know they have a Bible. They hide it so much. But you know, when we come to the church here, we are just happy and glad and proud to bring our Bibles along. So if you, are, if you have just started coming and uh, you are not used to it yet, get used to it and... Uh, Raise up your shoulders, bring along your Bible, it will do you good. You know, tonight it's so exciting as you come to open the verses um, that I'm going to read to you. They're, they're just terrific, just wonderful. And as we analyze them, and as we just explain them, you'll see how wonderful it is to have a taste of the life of the early church. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 5. Reading from verse 12 to verse 16. And by the hands of the apostles were signs and wonders wrought among the people. And they were always one accord in Solomon's porch. And of the rest does no man join himself to them, but the people magnified them. And believers were the more added to the Lord, multitudes, both of women, both of men and women, in so much that they brought forth the sick onto the streets and laid them on the beds and couches that at the least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. There came also a multitude out of the cities round about unto Jerusalem, 
bringing sick folks and them which were vexed or tormented or troubled with unclean spirits. And they were healed. How many of them? Everyone. Verse 12 opens with a sentence containing two words. Simple words, but dynamic, rich words. Signs and wonders. That verse 12 says, By the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. Now, let me talk to you a little about the church. You may not realize how important and how significant the church is in the sight of God, in the mind of God. You understand that God chose Abraham. And after Abraham, you have Isaac and Jacob. And you refer to the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And God raised up a nation. The name is Israel. It was so wonderful that Moses was telling the children of Israel, check it up, in which nation? As God made himself so clear, so near, that he will work the mighty things he has done amidst you. Find it out. As God made his hand, his power, his might, so near to any nation that he will even talk to that nation face to face, the Lord delighted in that nation Israel. And many things were done to the glory of the name of God, but through Israel. But then you know that Israel forsook the Lord, and the Lord raised up the church. A holy nation. A great, dynamic army of people. And the Lord just wanted to lavish his grace and his gift and all the resources of, of heaven upon the church. You know why the Lord wanted to do that? The Lord did, wanted to do that because the church is to be the bride of Christ. And Christ is to be the bridegroom or the husband of the church. The church is to be the bride or the wife. You know what a young man does after he has found a lady that he wants to get married to. All his resources, all his money, everything he has, he wants to put on that bride. Because he wants that bride to look so nice that she will be like the princess, the queen on the whole earth. And he spends everything, everything literally to make that woman what she ought to be. But let me tell you this. That, that man is so happy, so excited because of the qualities that he can find in the life of that woman, of that lady. And during the courtship, that husband-to-be, that bridegroom is watching that the qualities he saw before in the life of that bride will still remain there. If those qualities fade out, he becomes unhappy. He becomes uninterested. If uh, all the charming personality of the woman decreases in any way, the man is not happy till the day of marriage. In fact, you know, at the day of marriage, the man wants those qualities again, the beauty again, everything to come out with some splendor. And during the marriage, the man wants those qualities originally. The quality in behavior, in character, in conduct, in appearance, everything. The husband wants all that quality to remain. And there are problems in the mind of that man. If the qualities are fading out, I'm telling you something. The church is that wife, is that bride. And in the early church, as this church was betrothed unto Christ, given unto Christ, there were some qualities in that church. Purity, power, just the graces and the resources of heaven and the gifts of the Spirit in that church. You know, some preachers are saying that, well, the grace will not always be there in the church. The gift will not always be there in the church. The power will not always be there in the church. But, you know, I'm here to tell you, the husband will become uninterested any, anymore if those gifts and the traces and the resources and everything, if they are fading out. The Lord doesn't want the beauty of the church the power of the church, the charm of the church to pass away or to fade out. He wants it to remain in the church because that is what keeps Christ 
the bridegroom, interested in the church, the bride. But many preachers are saying that the church is no more like it is. Have you ever watched women after they get married? They don't stop getting the husbands interested in them. Well, they don't say now, I've got married, I'm now in the home. I'll not clean myself up. I'll not look nice to my husband. You know, they keep on, even at old age, they keep on to keep the interest of the husband. And the church as the bride of Christ will need to keep the grace of God, the gift of God, the power of the Holy Ghost, everything that was very good in the church originally. The church will need to keep it on until the end to keep the interest in the heart of the bridegroom, in the heart of Jesus. Because it says Jesus will be coming for a church without spot, without wrinkle. And he'll be taking that church to himself. I've said that to you to make you realize that the signs and the wonders in the early church are supposed to continue until the end of the age of the church. They must remain. Now, let me explain these two words to you. Signs and wonders. You know, every modern city today is full of signs, signboards. On the roads, there are signs. In front of shops, there are signs. Sometimes in front of, you know, in the streets, you see the signs pointing to the streets. If you go to a city where there is no sign, there will be confusion. You will not know where to buy what you want to buy. But it is a sign that shows the supermarket, the general market, the grocery. It's the sign that shows the pharmacist's shop. It's the sign that shows where the hospital is, where the offices are. It's the sign that points the direction to you. That's what signs are meant for. Signs point to something significant which you will need to know about. And the signs in the early church were pointing to somebody. When you come to the church, you need to know whether Christ is there or not. You need a sign that will point to you that here is the way to Christ. And those signs are the miracles. The miracles are the signs giving you the indication that Christ is still the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's still telling you that God says, I am God and change not. That's the sign of a miracle. A miracle is pointing to the care of God, to the involvement of God in the affairs of man. A miracle is a sign pointing to you that God is interested in you and he will use his power, his mind, to bless you. Now, how about wonder? Uh, you know, sometimes if you go on the side of the road, you see different signs. And they're in different sizes and different shapes. And if a villager will come to Lagos here, and um, he begins to see the signs, beautiful signs on our roads, and then if he comes at night, and uh, he goes by Ikorodu Road, or by Western Avenue in Lagos here, and he sees a particular sign in front of a shop, and that sign is, you know, just so colorful. There is red, there is green, there is white, there is blue. And you know, some of those words of the, ele with the electronic uh, gadgets that are put there, sometimes the green will fade out and the white will come out and the blue will come and the villager will just stand in front of that sign and open his mouth and say, Is this sign in Lagos? That's a wonder. The sign makes him to wonder. And that is a miracle. A miracle is a sign, and it is a sign pointing to Jesus, but, you know, it is so supernatural. It is so superhuman. It is so extraordinary. It is so special. It is so heavenly above man that the human being will open his mouth and say, I am surprised. It's a wonder. That's why the Bible uses those two words, signs and wonders. And he calls the miracles of the Bible. What God does are signs pointing to God, but they are so wonderful because they cause a wonder in the minds of people. Now, let me run with you very quickly through the scriptures to show you that it's not a new thing. Since old time, there has been signs 
They have been wonders. In Deuteronomy chapter 34, Deuteronomy chapter 34, let's read from verse 10 and verse 11. And there arose not a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face in all the signs and the wonders which the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh and to all, the, all his servants and to all his land. You know, when Moses came to Egypt and he threw the rod down, it became a serpent. What was that? A miracle? But what was he to say to Pharaoh? It was a sign unto Pharaoh that there is a greater God somewhere who has appeared unto me, who has told me, let my people go. And it was to be a wonder. It made Egypt to wonder. When, when um, Israel came before the Red Sea, and Moses stood before the Red Sea and he stretched his rod and the sea was parted. What is that? It's a sign that it wasn't just Moses that brought Israel out of Egypt. It was a sign that it was the very work of God. And when he stretched back the rod and the rod uh, made the water to come down on the Egyptians, it was a sign that God was on the side of Israel and it made the people to wonder. When the children of Israel went around Jericho and the walls of Jericho came down flat at the shout of the children of Israel, what was that? That was a sign that no matter how secured the children of this world may be, they may surround themselves with the walls of Jericho. But God was giving them a sign that at the right time when judgment will come, the walls will come down and God's people can enter in. And do you know, the scientist today may surround himself with the walls of science and technology. And he may surround his conscience and surround his heart with the walls of science and technology. Yet do you know, God has given us a sign that at the shout of the archangel, at the sound of the trumpet, the Lord is going to bring those walls of science and technology down and the scientists are not going to escape the judgment of God if they neglect the way of salvation. And you know, in the New Testament, to all these signs are given to us. And they're supposed to be pointing to God, who is mighty in power, who is great and majestic. And uh, the signs make us to wonder. You know what Nebuchadnezzar said? Let me read it to you. Daniel chapter 4. Daniel chapter 4. I'm reading there from verses 1 and 2. I thought it good... To show the signs and wonders that the high God has wrought toward me. How great are his signs. How mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. And his dominion is from generation to generation. What happened to him? The Lord spoke from heaven. And uh, his mind the Lord spoke from heaven and he sent his son. He sent his son. And a miracle was performed on Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And you know, when that miracle was performed, it, it was a sign, a sign to Nebuchadnezzar that God will protect his own. Nebuchadnezzar saw it and said, Did we not cast only three men into the fire? And um, they said, Yes. Then he said, I see, I see. I see the sun, the, a fourth person, four men standing in the fire, and the appearance of the fourth is like unto the Son of God. That's a sign unto him. And it made him to wonder. And then Nebuchadnezzar said, I thought it good to show the signs and the wonders that the Lord has wrought. And do you know when later I was even punished in such a miraculous way? Again he said it, that the signs that were wrought toward me. So you can see then signs and wonders, the miracles. In Daniel chapter 6, verse 27, He delivereth and rescueth, and he worketh signs and wonders in heaven and in earth, who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. Miracles are signs and wonders. John 
chapter 4. John chapter 4, verse 48. Then said Jesus unto him, Except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. The nobleman says unto him, Sir, come down, ere or before my child die. Jesus says unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. And as he was now going down, his servants met him, and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. Then inquired he of them the hour when he began to amend. And he said unto him, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in the which Jesus said unto him, Thy son liveth, and himself believed, and uh, his whole house. He had seen, according to verse 48, he had seen signs and wonders. Acts chapter 2, verse 22, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Verse 43, and fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. Chapter 4 of Acts, verse 29 and verse 30. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that, we, that with all boldness they may speak thy word, by stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child, Jesus. Signs and wonders. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 14. Verse 3, long time therefore abode they, speaking boldly in the name in the Lord, which gave testimony unto the word of his grace and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. So you can see from the Bible references I have read to you that it is the will of the Lord that these miracles point as signs to the power of God to the might of God and to the purpose of God as he helps humanity. And they're supposed to point to Jesus Christ who, only do, who does not only heal but he saves. And when the miracles happen, then it's a sign to the people that if God can do this, he can also save you if you come to him. It's a sign unto you that if God can do this, he can take over your life and begin to help you and continue to help you until the end. The miracles are signs pointing to Christ, and because they're supernatural, they make us to wonder. Now, Acts chapter 5. Let me read that verse 12 again. And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. Do you know that the word of God makes it very clear what the church ought to be? And uh, these things uh, you see here today are the things that ought to remain in the church. And the first one is, there was always an evidence of power. Evidence of power. Now you realize that uh, many times there is a lot of noise in the church, but it doesn't mean there is um, power in that, um, in that church. I'm sure you know when you, when you wake up in the morning and you want to get out with your car, with your vehicle, you get into that car, and um, the, the, the car may not be going anywhere, but you know, you warm it up, and it is making a lot of noise, a lot of noise, but you know, when you eventually go on the road, and you are making 120 kilometers per hour, and you are getting to your destination, it, it is even making less noise. But when it is going nowhere, the, the noise is so much. You get to the railway station and see those trains. You know, uh, they are blowing the horn, they are they're, they're doing everything, and they are puffing up the, the smoke. And then, you know, the noise is so much. But when it eventually gets on the rail and it's moving and going to a destination, there may be no noise, and yet it's going somewhere. 
I'm telling you something. The church should be recognized not by the lot of noise it makes within the church, by the shouting and the jumping and the clapping, but by the power that is in evidence. The power of God in evidence. And you know, when the church is on the move, when the church is really going somewhere, when the church is like it was and like it ought to be, there may not be a lot of noise and a lot of shaking and a lot of shouting, but there will be power being manifested. And in that early church, there was power. And they were moving on in such a wonderful way that they were just uh, signs and wonders to the people around. Well, that was not surprising to them. It was the fulfillment of what Jesus had told them. In Mark chapter 16, verses 17 and 18, and these signs, actually they are miracles, but now you know why they are called signs. They are signposts or signboards pointing to somebody pointing to Christ this sign shall follow them that believe in my name shall they cast out devils they shall speak with new tongues they shall take up serpents and if they drink any deadly thing it shall not hurt them they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover when those things are happening in your church in the name of the Lord demons being cast out the sick becoming healed, and those who have been given poison to take or to eat unknowingly, we're praying for them and they are getting healed. All those miracles are pointing to the fact that God is there. There are signs, and those signs are telling you if you want to worship God, stay in that place because God is there. Christ is there, and Christ is exalted. Those miracles are signs unto you to show you that if you're really looking for God, here is where God is, where those miracles are. Then you know that God is there. It's a sign to you. And in John chapter 14, verse 12, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. You know what Jesus was saying is this. The world will not see me. And they will not know where I have gone. In fact, some of them, some of the people in the world, may not believe at the beginning that I rose from the dead. But... When you, my disciples, apostles, and followers, when you go into the world, you are going to do something. The works I do, you will do also. When you do that, it will be a sign to the people around that this Jesus must be alive. Because the name of a dead man cannot work like this. If, a, if death has eternal, ultimate power against and over this man, his name will not be working miracles like this. And therefore, when you go out and you are doing those same works that I have been doing, it will be a sign that will make the people of the world to wonder. But that sign will be pointing to the fact that I am risen, I am ascended, and I go unto my Father. You will even do greater works than these. And so you now realize what those miracles are meant for. They are the signs pointing to Christ. God's name was glorified in the early church. And his power was in evidence through the apostles. And it says in Acts chapter 5, verse 12, By the hands of the apostles were many, many, many signs and wonders wrought among the people. And they were all with one accord, in Solomon's porch. They were united. That means that they allowed their hearts to be circumcised, sanctified, made holy. Because, you know, when you are sanctified and purified at heart, it's easy for you to keep in unity with the believers. There was power, there was purity. There was a spirit baptism, there was sanctification. These were people who did not just follow after power, miracle, without following after unity in the body of Christ. And it must still be so today that we must still be with one accord, united. And it's not easy to be united if we are not holy, if we are not sanctified. But it remained sanctified and they were united. Now, I've told you about the power. Let me talk to you about the purging. Purging. 
I told you last week that Ananias and Sapphira, the wife, they sold a possession. That's in Acts chapter 1, verses 1 to 11. But then uh, they pretended and they came with a lie. They wanted to create a false impression. And because of that, the judgment of God came on Ananias and came on Sapphira. It was a great sin. And it made the, the hearts of the people in the church, obviously, it must have made them sad and sorrowful. But let me tell you something. The Lord wanted the church to remain pure. And he did not want the devil to pollute or to corrupt the church at this point. And therefore, he made sure that he purged that church of hypocrisy. And what was the effect of that purging? The effect of that punishment? Look at verse 5. Acts chapter 5, verse 5. Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost. And great fear, great fear came on all them that heard these things. The purging had an effect on the church, an effect on all the people that heard about it. It created a good, godly, healthy fear in the hearts of the people. And they were afraid to be hypocritical. They started dealing with sins in their lives because they knew that even though there were miracles of mercy, listen to me, there were also miracles of judgment. Even though there were miracles that came to comfort, there were also miracles that came to convict. Even though there were miracles that, was, that just were like cooling rivers of the love of God, yet there were miracles that, like, that were just like the burning fires of the very indignation of God. And they knew that the miracles were used to manifest the power of God, to help people, to heal people, and as, at the same time to judge and to punish people and to purge the church. Because of that, fear came on all the people that heard. Look at verse 10. Then fell she down straightway at his feet and yielded up the ghost. And the young men came in and, and found her dead and carrying her forth, buried her by her husband. And great fear, and great fear, and great fear came upon all the church and upon as many as heard these things. And verse 13, and of the rest dost no man join himself to them. What, what did that do? It purged the church. Hypocrites heard about it, they stayed away. Those who were pretending they, they heard about it, they stayed away because they knew that if you got into that church, God was at work. He was healing the sick, he was killing rebels as well. And because of that, the hypocrites just stayed away and no man, that means no hypocrite and no pretending sinner came to join them. And then it says something, but the people magnified them. Magnify them. Have you ever used a magnifying glass to look at something that is tiny? And that magnifying glass will increase the size of what you are looking at. What this is saying is the people that saw the church pure, powerful, and holy, they put a magnifying glass on the, on the church and they magnified their love and they magnified the power of God in their midst and they magnified the activities of the Holy Ghost in their midst. It was like God put a magnifying glass in the hands of the people of the world to magnify the church in their eyes. And uh, you know, the influence of the church was magnified because God was at work. Now, let me talk to you a little about purging the church and the effect it has on people. You know, right from the beginning of um, God's dealing with man, he himself has been involved in purging the church. You remember I told you last week that when people commit sin, now others may not know about it, but God punishes sin. You better believe it. He punishes sin. But I told you, he punishes sin in different, different ways. If you remember, I told you last week the way he punished Cain for what he did was totally different from the way he punished Miriam for what he did, or for what she did. For Cain, it was a mark set upon him. And the devil could see that mark that God was at enmity against Cain. 
And devil, the devil could do anything against him because there was a mark upon him. But you know, when Miriam was punished because of the sin she committed, leprosy came upon her. You remember Abihu and Nadab. The children of Aaron, they offered strange fire in the, in the temple of the Lord, in the tabernacle of the Lord, and fire came down from heaven and just consumed them. You remember Korah, Des, and Abiram, the earth opened and swallowed them up. God uses different ways and different means of um, punishing and purging those who commit sin. But you know, I want to tell you something. The Lord doesn't always do it himself. And you know, it's wonderful he doesn't always do it himself. You think about it. If God still continued and he did it himself every time. You know, every time a person told a lie, every time a person pretended, every time a person became proud inside him because he preached or because he sang or because he did something in the church, if God just visited him and just killed him, the church will be going to the graveyard and to the mortuary every week. You know, think about it like uh, since January now, during the first week in January, somebody did something wrong and jo God just said, that's it, you've got it, killed him. And in the second week, killed him. You know, by now, anytime we are coming, the people at the mortuary will say, here they come again, another person has died in their church. So God doesn't always do that. You know what God has done now? He has committed the responsibility of purging the church into the hands of the pastors in the churches. He says, well, if I do it myself, you'll feel it more. But now the pastors who are representatives of God in the church, they are the people to carry on the discipline and the purging of the church. And, and that, that's better. That's better. Because, you know, after all, he won't kill I doubt if he would even uh, beat uh, the person in discipline. I think uh, all he will do is just rebuke him and correct him. And then if the person makes right his way, then he'll be brought back into the fellowship of the children of God. Now, let me show you this in the Bible. That now God has committed the punishment or the discipline of members of the church to the pastors. He doesn't do it himself any longer directly. Directly. Now, First Timothy chapter 5. Verse 20, them that sin rebuke before all, that others also may fear. In the church, that is also, uh, still continuing. Them that sin, them that sin within the church, rebuke before all. What I mean is, you're a member of the church, and you become careless in your life, careless in your conduct, and um, the pastor knows about it, of course you'll be rebuked before all so that others who hear that may fear it will have the effect on the church that they will not want to continue in the in, a, in the example of unrighteousness in titus chapter 1 verse 13 this witness is true wherefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith uh, you know, sometimes the life and the ministry of a pastor is, uh, you know, sometimes very strange. Sometimes the pastor will come in here in this church and will preach a wonderful message on love, sharing, fellowship, communion, and embracing one another. And you'll say, this is wonderful. You know, the message is just so enriching and it cools your heart. And you are so happy and you are there in the church and you have enjoyed the message on love and fellowship and communion and sharing together and embracing one another. And um, one hour after that, you are called by the pastor and um, he is very sharp with you because you have done something that is evil something that is bad something that has a corrupting influence on the church and he rebukes you sharply and you look at his face he, uh, this man that has just finished uh, preaching on love and fellowship and communion and embracing one another and he frowns his face and you say well is he getting angry you better believe it is angry against sin and he's sharp about it and he's definite about it and he's firm about it 
And you know, some people will not understand that. They say, well, I, I don't understand. Maybe the pastor is not even listening to the cassette of the message he preaches because he has just finished talking on love and see him rebuking me sharply. Listen to me. That is a ministry of the pastor. He must rebuke sharply for one purpose, so that you may be sound in the faith. In 2 Thessalonians, I'm reading chapter 3, verse 14. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man, and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. You see that? There is a, you know, when you discipline people, uh, the complaint they make is, well, I like discipline. What I don't like is that um, the way the pastor dealt with my case, I was ashamed. He humiliated me. He, he made it public. Well, you don't understand. Uh, discipline is supposed to make you ashamed of the evil, the sin, the corruption in your life. And if you are not ashamed of yourself when you are disciplined, if it doesn't bring humiliation upon you, it is not discipline. And so you realize that all these things we do in the life of the church, we follow the Bible, we follow the Word of God. Now, listen to me. I want to tell you something very serious. Very, very serious. And I hope you take it very seriously. I've told you that God, in his mercy, in his love, he doesn't do the discipline himself anymore directly. I've told you that. But listen to me. He can still do it if you, as a member of the church, the pastor has called you, and the pastor has corrected you, the pastor has exhorted you, the pastor has rebuked you, the pastor has brought discipline upon you, but you don't worry about it. And you still go about, say, gossiping, saying, well, I'm not the only bad person in the church. After all, what have I done? I'm not the only one that is corrupt and evil and sinful in the church. After all, what have I done? Did I kill anybody? If God will mark iniquity, will anybody stand in the church? You know, if you're under discipline and you're going about like that, you know, just trying to build up your image. And people ask you, and they say, well, uh, what really happened? Well, you say, I don't know this uh, church. Uh, I don't know what they are doing. Uh, that pastor, uh, I don't think he even has the love of God in him. Instead of you accepting your shame, accepting your reproach, and coming under the discipline of the church. Now, if you become rebellious, God will step in. He'll say, pastor, you've done your part. I'll take over. And if he does that, if he does that, you are in trouble. Look at it in the Bible. First Corinthians chapter 5. First Corinthians chapter 5 from verse 1. It is commonly reported that there is fornication among you. Such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife, the stepmother. And ye are puffed up. And have not rather mourned that he which he that has done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I verily, as I sent in the body, but present in spirit, have judged already. As though I were present concerning him that has so done this deed. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together, and my spirit or the power of our Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. I'm sure you don't want that. You don't want that. For your body or for yourself to be delivered into the hands of Satan... Uh, for you to have been corrected in the church and still to shrug your shoulder, to be stiff-necked and to be rebellious and stubborn until uh, the church cannot do anything anymore. And uh, the Lord says, I'll take over, I'll just handle him myself. Don't allow the Lord to handle you himself. It's better that the pastor does it. It's better that, you know, uh, it, it's done in a, in a way that you will be able to benefit. You know, I remember 1951. I was uh, running away from school. And I will, I'll come back from school. You know, I go straight to the school very quickly. Those days I was very clever. I'm not as clever now. 
and I will go to the church and answer yes sir, to the uh, to the register. And uh, while we are changing classes at 8.30 or 9, I am out of that place and I'm out with my books. And I go to bury my books somewhere. And then I go back to the house to either take um, fish or sugar or something. And I've been doing that for a number of, uh, for a number of days. Now, if I did that and I went, to, I went back to school the second day, the teacher will call me and he will say, well, carry him. And he gave me just uh, three or four strokes. You know what? In those days, I was used to it. And, um, you know, I just uh, pat my buttocks. And then while I'm, while I'm facing the class and backing the teacher, I'll be making some signs with my face to show the class that I'm not bothered. But, you know, this day, 1951, I ran from school like that. And I wanted to go for my regular gari sugar and um, fish. And I met my father at home. And he said, uh, what are you doing here? I said he sent us from school to come and collect the harvest uh, money. How much? I told him. He put the money in his pocket. And then he said, let's go to the school together. (laughs) While we were going on the way, he used his uh, knife and then he caught a big stick. And he, and, he, and he went to the school with me and got to the headmaster and uh, said, um, is it true that you've sent this boy home to collect this? And the headmaster said, no, in fact, we've had this problem with your boy. He's been running away from school. We felt we could deal with him ourselves. That's why we didn't report to you. And uh, my father said, please, headmaster, can you help me and um, get the whole school for me? I won't waste your time. And the headmaster did, and he got the whole school, and my father said he should carry me. He didn't allow the headmaster or the teacher to beat me, and he knew me. Well, he's my father. He knew me. He knew where the thing was pain, and he beat me like he wanted me to die. It killed me. I never could do it again. You know what I'm saying? If the teacher in the church is rebuking you, You know, you may be making signs with your facial appearance to the other members of the church saying, well, I don't worry, I don't worry, but one day is coming. Your heavenly father will take over. He'll say, I'll deal with him myself. And when God does that, and he deals with you himself, because you have been rebellious, rejecting the correction of the church, it's going to be a terrible thing. Don't wait until that time. If you have been rebuked and corrected by the church, by the pastor in the church, it's better that you just obey. Now, look at um, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. From verse 27, Wherefore, Whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself. And so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep, many die. The Lord had dealt with them himself. Look at verse 31. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. If you judge yourself, when you see that you have done something very wrong and that will bring a reproach on the church, that will spoil the church, you come to report yourself. You judge yourself then you will not be judged by God. And there will not be anything that will, you know, be so terrible on you because you are judging yourself. But if you don't judge yourself, and if you allow the thing to just spread and spread and spread until other people are knowing about this and you have a corrupting influence in the church, then the Lord will have to step in if you have been rebellious in the church. I told you all this so that you'll be watchful in your life. Come back to Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. I told you the effect of the discipline in the church, the effect of the purging in the church. Now, let's see verse 14. Evangelizing the people. The evangelization of the people. Verse 14. And the believers were the more added to the Lord, multitudes, both of men and women. Let me say something to you here. You know, as this is written, verse 14, 
believers were the more added unto the Lord. Multitudes both of, what's the next word? What's the next word after that? And women. You know in our modern world, the women are, are kind of funny, fighting for their rights. And they say, uh, the, the men should always be coming behind. They want us to, you know, copy everything in all that we do, women first. Women first. They want you to kneel down for them, bow down to them, cringe for them, do everything for them. Because, you know, they want us even in the church to say, after you, after you. But I'm telling you, the church in the church, there is a recognition of the fact of men and women. Let's stay scriptural in the church. Now, as we talk about evangelization of the people, now you'll think that the purging of the church, the punishment on Ananas and Sapphira, you will think it will decrease the church. You will think that it will make the church just to scatter. No, no, not at all. You know what is beautiful here? Ananas was a rich man, you can tell, because he had a possession to sell. Those days, many of the people in the church were just slaves and servants slaves and servants. In fact, as you read church history, church history bears it out that in those days, the majority of the people were just slaves and servants. And that's why Paul the Apostle said in 1 Corinthians, you see your calling brethren, how that not many mighty, not many noble are called. Many of the people were just poor. But Ananias was rich. Because he was rich, he was also influential. And then he was known to the apostles. You know, nobody introduced Ananias to Peter the apostle, he just mentioned his name and said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart? He knew him. Not only that, he had an easy access to the apostles. You know how many people were in the church in those days? At this time, they were numbering into thousands, thousands, a great multitude, and yet Peter could spot out Ananias. I'm telling you something. Even though Ananias was rich, well known to the apostles, well known to the whole congregation, easily having easy access to the apostles when the punishment came upon him because of his sin. Do you know the church did not grumble? Do you know the tribesmen that came from the same tribe as Ananias? Do you know they didn't grumble? Do you know that the people who depended upon the riches of Ananias, who Ananias had been caring for these people before, and they knew him is so, you know, beneficial to them. You know, they didn't grumble. They knew that this was a God, this was a God of heaven purging his church. Uh, but you know, in churches today, if a rich man is disciplined in the church, I don't mean a church like this. Here we are not worshipping man, we worship God. But I'm, I'm talking about these churches outside, some of the churches you came from. If they discipline a rich man, a car owner, his tribesmen will rise up in that church and they'll say, we don't agree, we don't agree. And other people will start fighting the leaders of that church because a rich man had been disciplined. You know that the wife also had easy access to Peter the apostle, because three hours later she came in. And as she came in, she just went straight to the apostle. She didn't need to see any usher to see the apostles. She did not need to get a card to even see the apostles. She just went in and there was a great multitude. And immediately Peter recognized the wife. Didn't need any introduction. I mean, they were, they were well known to the apostles and said, did you sell it for so much? And she said, yes. And judgment came. Because of that lie, because of that sin, the ushers came in immediately and they bound her up and took her away. The ushers were not sentimental, crying there, saying, Peter, what has happened? You are killing the rich men in our church. How shall we be able to continue the church? Nothing like that. I'm telling you that the early church was a disciplined church, a wonderful church, a sound church. And if this church is going to be sound like that, if anybody is disciplined, either by God or by the pastor, you will just go on your knees and you will pray. And you stay with the church, united with the church. Because you're not going to go away from God because Ananias is disciplined or because Aphira is disciplined. And so you see, evangelism continued and great multitudes of men and women, they were still turning to the Lord, even though that thing had happened in the first 11 verses. A good, wonderful church. Now, let's go on to verse 15 and verse 16. The enlargement of Peter's ministry. 
the enlargement of Peter's ministry. Verse 15. In so much that they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches. That's saying on simple beds and simple couches, as well as sophisticated, costly, um, more convenient beds and couches. The, what's used there, they depict a rich man being brought and poor men being brought. That at the least, the shadow, the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. There came also a multitude out of the cities round about unto Jerusalem, bringing sick folks, and them that were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed, everyone, everyone. The power of God was still mightily flowing in their midst. I'm telling you something this night, that Peter was making progress in his ministration to the sick. Do you know that before, he had been sent out with other people two by two, and they will lay hands on the sick. And they will pray, sometimes for hours. And they will pray for the sick. But now, his ministry was enlarged. He didn't need to even pray anymore, sometimes. He didn't need to lay hands on people, sometimes. He didn't need anything, sometimes. All that he needed was just to walk by. And a shadow coming on the people will get the people healed. That's an enlargement of ministry. What do you learn from that? If you are a fellowship leader, if you are a Bible study teacher, if you are an, if you are an area leader, a zona leader, a state representative, a representative of this ministry in a, in a country, in Africa, wherever it is, your ministry ought to enlarge in wisdom, in power, in your approach, in the things that the Lord is using you to do, you'll be increasing in knowledge, increasing in power, increasing in understanding until your ministry is getting enlarged. It doesn't mean that your, your shadow is going to heal. For Paul, it wasn't a shadow. It was aprons and handkerchiefs brought near to his body and taken to other people. Those special miracles were done. For Elisha, it wasn't a shadow. It wasn't his clothes. It was the bone of Elisha after Elisha died that he dropped a dead man and that dead man touched the bones of Elisha and he stood up. So in various ways, there are various and different ways in which God can enlarge your ministry, enlarge your ministration, enlarge your understanding, enlarge the way you are a benefit to society and to the church. If you will wait upon the Lord and stand with the Lord and keep your heart and keep your life clean unto the Lord. As I close, let me read to you in Second. Timothy, chapter 2, from verse 19. Second Timothy, chapter 2, verse 19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having the seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. Do you belong to the Lord? Think about it. The Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver but also of wood and of earth. Some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these. Purge yourself. Purge yourself. Purge yourself. Don't wait for the pastor to come and purge you and discipline you. You purge yourself and discipline yourself. Get on your knees. Examine your life. If a man therefore purge himself from this, don't wait for God to come and do it. To lay such a heavy punishment upon you because of your rebellion and your hard-heartedness in sin. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, prepared unto every good work. Flee also, run away also from youthful lust, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Rise up and let us pray. You can bring yourself to the Lord. Bring your life to the Lord. If you have been under discipline and all you are doing is just um, laughing about it, 
just jesting about it with your friends, ridiculing the pastor, saying he's a pastor that is foolish for correcting you. Why not bring your life to the Lord? Purge yourself. Purge yourself. Don't let God come and do it himself. Purge yourself. Examine your life before the Lord. The miracles of God cannot continue in your life and through your life except you bring your life under the control of the word of God. But you know, if you are a liar, a hypocrite, a pretender, uh, the judgment of the Lord may fall. Be very careful. Be very careful. If you are still telling lies and you are still exaggerating and you are still going about gossiping and backbiting and doing what is evil or perhaps stealing and committing adultery and fornication and you are naming yourself with the name of Christ, why not come before the Lord and purge yourself and confess it to the Lord to forgive you and to cleanse you with the blood of Jesus Christ to change your life? You know, God is no respecter of persons. You may be rich and you may be old, whatever your position, God hates sin in the church. And if you're a member of the church, if you profess to have known the Lord, purge yourself, purge yourself, purge yourself. God will not take sin in his church. If you'll confess to the Lord and you make up your mind, you're not going to continue in that, the Lord will forgive and cleanse with the blood of Jesus Christ. Don't play with the sword of God. Don't play with the fire of God. He punishes sin and he, did, he still does it today. Don't let any sin remain in your life. Root it out. Expose it to God. If it is something you have done, you know it will affect the church. Report yourself to the pastor. That's better than God himself stepping in to discipline you. Is your ministry enlarging? Are you the same old fellow five years, ten years, twenty years, you remain the same? Any change? Any improvement? Any enlargement? Purge yourself. 